Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by conducting a very simple experiment. So, when you're ready, please smile at a stranger. Uh, no, I don't mean me. <laughs> Pick anyone you want, uh, and if they're cute, all the better. <laughs> and just smile. Go on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. So you've just proved that Dubliners are really very nice people. Uh, you just need a clown to make you smile, uh, and I'm only too happy to be that clown today. Um, I'm going to talk about the grown-up terms for the work that we do. Uh, those terms are civic pride, uh, which is the amount of goodwill that a society has for itself, and social capital, which is the feeling that strangers get when they decide to tickle each other's minds. Now, you might think this sounds like uh, very fluffy work, uh, but I submit that it's really rather important. After all, the majority of human beings now live in towns and cities. By the year 2050, there will be five billion city zens. How we interact in the context of serious threats like global warming, religious tension, and overpopulation will determine whether our species survives this century. Civilization means being civil. Without the veneer of mutual respect, a society falls apart. I've been interested in civic engagement since the 29th of September, 1979. That was the day the Pope John Paul II addressed a million people in Dublin's Phoenix Park. That morning, my father, who's somewhere out there, drove his blue Renault 5 through the deserted streets of Dublin. It was green lights all the way to the synagogue. There was no great rush for Yom Kippur. I said, Dad, did we back the wrong horse? <laughs> and the look in his face set me off on this journey towards identity, community, belonging. The feeling you get when the bartender knows your name. I've always wanted to be a Dubliner. I was born here. I love the place and the people. And this week, I even love the weather. <laughs> but most of all, I love the humor, because tickles are not so different to gentle digs. Dublin is a place where we say your man is running around like a dog with two Mickeys. <laughs> and she's so plain, even the toad wouldn't take her out. <laughs> but a love of language is not enough. My father is Jewish. I don't speak Irish. And to many local ears, I sound English. What right have I to call myself a Dubliner? To answer that question, I had to emigrate. How Dublin is that? In New York, during the 1990s, I saw firsthand the power of a great city brand. But when we talk about New York as a gilded metropolis with a distinct personality of its own, the Big Apple, we forget that cities have been branded for thousands of years. Athens was the cradle of democracy. Rome, the capital of an empire. Cities are happier more prosperous places when their character is defined 
and actively promoted. Think of I Amsterdam. I love New York. And my personal favorite, the slogan for the town of Hooker, Oklahoma. It's a location, not a vocation. <laughs> I never did make it to Hooker, sadly. Uh, the tug of home got the better of me in the year 2000. The Irish economy was overheating when I came home to launch the Dubliner magazine. It was a strange time in the culture. It felt like the last sweaty days before the birth of Mr. Burns. Celebrity dentists appeared on chat shows. Taxi drivers had property empires. <laughs> and when The Economist said we had the best quality of life in all the world, the praise was received with indifference. It was like being told how great you are by Clint Eastwood. <laughs> so I launched a magazine to berate the city I love. And when I sold it, I wrote a book that was described by one of the few people who read it as an awkward history of the Celtic tiger. I'm referring, of course, to my wife, and I'm not even sure she got to the end. <laughs> The point of that book is that we are mongrels, one and all. But it only took me 30 years to find that out. Louis McNeese, a poet from Belfast, once called Dublin the Fort of the Dane, the garrison of the Saxon, the Augustan capital of a Gaelic nation. It was, of course, an English city, yet even now, 90 years after independence, some of us find it hard to move on. That may explain why, at the height of that boom, we decided to close our civic museum. A city turns its back on the past. At the height of that economic exuberance. We all know what happens next. I propose that Dublin is not just the capital of this country. It's widely seen as the national menace. Last year, a survey revealed that only 25% of Irish people feel any emotional connection to the capital. When you exclude Dubliners, that figure goes down to 15%. In other words, eight out of 10 Irish people have no relationship with their own capital. It doesn't need to be like this. As we approach, as indeed as we enter, a decade of major historical centenaries, pride in Dublin could yet serve as a bulwark against the excesses of traditional nationalism. Attachment to our capital, active, engaged attachment, could even serve as a quick tickle to the slow drag of traditional nationalism. There are some people who think of Dublin as a mosaic of villages, or even as two towns separated by the Liffey. It really is time to get over that river. And I make no apology for pointing to the economic rationale of doing so. Dublin is responsible for half the jobs in this country, nearly half the goods and services, half the tax revenue. Without a strong, dynamic capital, this country will remain on its knees. So what can we do to increase the goodwill that Dublin has for itself? One night I met a friend for a drink in a pub not too far from here. We fell into conversation with a young Australian who just arrived. 
When we asked him why he'd come, he said, because I heard you guys are really friendly. So we bought him a drink, partly out of guilt, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Welcomed him to Dublin and told him what to see. And in that simple act, we felt like proud, useful Dubliners. In short, we felt tickled. That night, I discovered online that 94% of visitors cite friendly people as the highlight of their visit to Dublin. Which is kind of weird, right? <laughs> I mean, here we are in this city that everyone loves, except us. So I ran upstairs to my wife, woke her up, <laughs> proudly announced my plan to rebrand Dublin as the friendliest city in the world. She sat up, wiped her eyes, and said, did you remember to put the bins out? <laughs> the following morning, I called everyone I know, and plenty I don't, but the answer was the same wherever I went. Eventually, I doorstepped a man called Michael Stubbs, who worked at that time for Dublin City Council. He's part of the reason I'm here today. The result of that pint with one Australian is a civic initiative called City of a Thousand Welcomes, in which Dubliners volunteer to welcome a visitor to the city. We launched the campaign, or we launched the service, rather, with a campaign to recruit 1,000 volunteers in three months. 1,000 people who would proudly represent this city for nothing. Two weeks later, we had 2,531. Krishnamurti talked about smiling at one person every day. Gandhi talked about being the change you want to see in the world. We talk about putting the fun into fundamental economic crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. According, according to the Sydney Morning Herald, City of a Thousand Welcomes is the best free thing to do in Europe. Let's meet some of the team. There's a new way for visitors to explore the hidden Dublin. It's really great to be able to meet someone from the city who knows all the out-of-the-way places that wouldn't be in every tourist's handbook. An easy way for travellers to meet the friendliest people in the world. I enjoy meeting people. I enjoy helping visitors to Dublin have as good an experience as possible. See Dublin through the eyes of a Dubliner. City of a Thousand Welcomes, where Dublin meets the world. Just a much better way of experiencing a city. So here's the thing. When you launch a service like City of a Thousand Welcomes, you need to put it somewhere beautiful. Because let's face it, you don't take visitors down to the basement. Here in Ireland, we take them to what we call the good room. <laughs> so we said all this to Michael Stubbs and his colleagues in Dublin City Council. And when they stopped laughing, they kindly provided us with a great old house right in the center of town. Then we asked you, the people of Dublin, to give us a hand to furnish that house. The result is a new People's Museum of Dublin, staffed by volunteers and full of things donated by ordinary Dubliners. It feels like a great privilege to work on a project like this. We're predicting 20,000 visitors will come to the museum this first year. And that is an amazing reflection of the goodwill and genuine civic pride that there actually is in this city once you tap into it. Last Saturday morning, we gave our first tour of the museum in Polish, Dublin's second language. Every morning, we give free civics classes to local school children. 
They're called I Love Dublin. And yes, I borrowed that title. <laughs> During these classes, we talk about this man. Who is he? James Connolly. Thank you. One of the heroes of Irish nationalism, Connolly was executed for staging an up, a, a rebellion against British rule. Yet James Connolly spoke with a Scottish accent. And when Connolly ran for election to Dublin Corporation, his constituency included the Jewish quarter. In fact, there were so many Jews in Little Jerusalem that James Connolly had his election literature printed in Yiddish. That was in 1902. So maybe I'm not such a blow-in after all. I discovered that fact because I work in this small museum. And if the Pope hadn't come to Dublin, I'm not sure where I'd be today. So you ask me why civic pride is important. And I say, because I didn't have it. And now I do. And every single day, I see the power of civic engagement. When you lead a group of Dubliners around the little museum, and you show them a photograph of the Theatre Royal, which closed in 1962, that's 50 years ago. When you show them that photo, some of them will give you a TED talk on its complete history. When a grandmother tells a room full of strangers about her first kiss in the back row, I promise you, something special happens. Our current challenge is to measure the value of that something. For years, social scientists struggled to put a price on the sort of work we're doing. But two years ago, a major US study conducted by Gallup revealed a link between money and civic pride. Gallup found that communities with higher proportions of attached citizens had much stronger GDP growth in the previous five years than communities with smaller proportions of attached citizens. We've known for years that people lead longer, healthier lives in socially engaged communities, but we're just beginning to understand the extent to which social capital can also help to revive dying economies. Indeed, the economic argument may be the strongest of all. When a city gives a gift to itself, be it a new brand or a new museum. That gift has a powerful impact, not simply on civic pride, but also on economic performance. So here's the thing. We need your help. If you want to get involved, all you have to do is tickle someone's mind or simply smile and see what happens. This dirty old town may yet take its place among the great small cities of the world. Thank you.